On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Essence. And Essence was in an emotionally and physically abusive relationship that resulted in extreme PTSD. It's a story about being controlled and how your mind and body can start shutting down until you don't recognize yourself anymore. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of narcissistic abuse. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad, and thanks for tuning into this episode. So what is a narcissist, you may ask? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, we refer to a narcissist as anyone who has displayed a pattern of behavior that shows a limited capacity to appreciate others' perspectives. It is that simple. And now, before we get to our episode with Essence, I just wanted to thank everyone in the Narcissist Apocalypse community for listening to the show and sharing your thoughts by email, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. A big shout out to all of our friends in our Narcissist Apocalypse Facebook support group for just being a great group of people. Also, a reminder, if you haven't left us a review on whatever podcast service you use, Spotify, Apple, Google, Stitcher, CastBox, etc., leave us a five-star written review as it helps out the show when it comes to rankings. Now, the quickest way to be part of our show is if you want to read a letter to your narcissist and be a part of our Letters to Our Narcissist Volume 3 compilation episode. We have a voicemail recorder on our website. To record, go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. It's on the right-hand side of the page. It's always floating and hard to miss. There's a button there that says Send Voicemail. Press it. It records up to five minutes. If you need more than once, twice, three times, as many times as you need, we're accumulating these episodes, these episodes, (laughs) these letters for a volume three of our Letters to My Narcissist episode. If you want myself or Melissa to read that letter instead, just send it to NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com with Letters to My Narcissist in the subject line. I'm having trouble today, guys. We're getting through this. All right. Before I get out of my own way, I just wanted to give everyone a trigger warning on this episode. We do discuss suicide in this episode in the last quarter of it. We also, there's um, talk of physical abuse in this. This also can trigger, trigger you as well. So uh, later on in the episode, you'll hear that. I will put a note in the notes I guess in the description as well of the time we discuss specifically the suicide aspect of the show. It's very brief, but I just want to make sure everyone out there knew it was coming. And last thing, we'll officially be starting up a second podcast in a couple of weeks with some mental health professionals. We'll discuss topics and take questions from you guys. The first two recordings have been completed. They were awesome. So a big thank you to Julie L. Hall and Debbie Tudor for taking part on our new show. And now... It's time for the show. And for me to get out of my own way, here is my conversation with Essence. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode. I am here with Essence. How are you, Essence? I'm doing okay. Great um, today. I'm taking it one day at a time. And I apologize to you because my phone uh, cut out there when we were beginning this recording. So this is the second time we were recording this intro. (laughs) Um, And you have a very interesting story. You've had a history of suffering from PTSD throughout this whole whole entire uh, process in the aftermath, especially later in your relationship and what you were dealing with. And you had a very difficult time and you're still kind of in it, but you're, you're, you're out of the situation. You're just still dealing with the PTSD. And for a lot of people out there, they're going to uh, really resonate with your story and what you dealt with. And I just want to thank you for being part of our show and being here today to tell your story. And it's an honor for you to, for me to, to, to listen to it. And, uh, and now, uh, I'm just going to get out of your way and give you, uh, the floor to tell your story. Well, thank you, um, Brandon, for allowing me to tell my story. Um, for me, it is 
part of my healing. Um, it's not a major part, but it, it is a, a vital part for me um, in, in moving forward. I think in telling my story, um, it kind of brings it to reality. It makes it true. It convinces myself that, you know, it did happen. And, you know, if I continue to not tell my story and hold it in, then it's just like saying nothing ever existed. And then I will find myself right back in the same situation again. So I do have to say thank you and just to say thank you for everyone out there who will be listening. And I hope everyone out there does get something, you know, out of my story. I um, never thought I would actually find myself in this situation. Um, in, in getting into this situation, I, I felt kind of weak, lost, confused. Um, I met this person, um, and I'm going to give him a name because I guess, well, I guess it really doesn't matter. <laughs> But I'm going to say I met um, Mark coming off of a separation um, but when I was married. Um, at that time when I met Mark, I had it all together. Um, I, you know, I had my children. I was doing good for my kids. My son was just, you know, graduated from high school on his way to college to live on campus, you know, about an hour away. And, um, you know, I had a very good job, making very good money. Um, my credit was absolutely solid. It was good. That was something I worked on. Um, and I was living my life, you know, with my two children, you know, not really looking to get into any serious relationship during that time um, because of what I had gone through in my marriage. You know, it put me in a state of mind where, I was looking to do something that can uplift women, and um, I wanted to do a radio show. I had a girlfriend who had her own radio show, which we were Facebook friends at the time, and she always posted about the show. So I reached out to her and asked her, you know, how to get started, you know, to pretty much direct me into doing the radio show. And she invited me to come sit on her radio show. And that is how I met um, Mr. Mark. Eventually, I got to know he was the owner of of the studio, and I got to know him. You know, he would come in, and he would tell me, you know, how, you know, different things I can do, you know, or, you know, on the radio, how to be a little bit more comfortable. You know, we would talk after the show, and then eventually he would come in after my show, you know, told me I need to loosen up. You know, he would pour me a glass, you know, something to drink. He seemed like a very nice guy, you know, always smiling. That's what kind of attracted me to him, his smile. He seemed very gentle. Um, it just seemed like our spirits were in tune with each other. Um, very charis- charismatic. Um, just watching him, you know, in the studio around other people who would come in the studio to record their music. Everybody seemed to just enjoy him. It was always Mark, 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 Mark. Mark is the mastermind. Um, You know, Mark does this. You know, if if everybody was in the studio, he would buy everybody lunch, um, pay for everybody's meals. Um, He just seemed nice. And, you know, one day I was in the studio, and um, he didn't seem like a person that was off or seemed like someone who um, didn't have it all together. Um, Is it fair to say at this point that you are very impressed with him and how other people are perceiving him as someone who... I would, yes. Yeah, so like like he, he, everyone loves him. Um, there, if everyone loves him here and everything like that, how can there anything be wrong with this guy? Um, you know, as far as uh, trust uh, goes, if everyone else is, is feeling this way or it looks like this way, what should be wrong with this guy? Right. So pretty much because, again, um, my girlfriend was doing a radio show at the time in the studio. 
And, you know, she said some things about him, too. Oh, he's a nice guy. Um, you know, so, and, she, you know, she felt comfortable. She knew them for a very long time because she was doing her radio show in that studio for about, you know, a couple of years. So that was always, that was also a very comfortable feeling to know. So I didn't, you know, so I didn't feel like it was someone I couldn't trust. Or I had to worry about, you know, this is someone I was doing a radio show in his studio every Sunday. Um, eventually, you know, one day um, he actually um, took me on a date. Nice restaurant, expensive restaurant. Um, we got to talking, you know, about different things. Um, and that's where, you know, I started getting a little bit more comfortable because I started getting to know him. Um, we talked a lot about our past, family, and goals. So it seems like with our goals, we had some things in common. You know, after that, after that one particular date, we started going on dates weekly, um, every week, um, which, of course, I started getting a little bit more comfortable. I felt kind of safe, kind of secure. Is it fair to say at this point that you're feeling cared for in a way that you weren't cared for ever before? Prior, you saying in my marriage? Uh, yeah, or just, uh, I guess, uh, throughout your life, or is it just um, in your previous marriage? Um, I think, you know, in comparison with, you know, with this relationship, you know, dating him and my previous relationship and my marriage, it was completely different because in my marriage, I pretty much did everything. Um, I felt like I was wearing the pants in my relationship. I pretty much held everything down because my spouse at the time, you know, was inconsistent with anything that he did. You know, he may, he worked, but he didn't keep jobs very long. Um, six months in, he'd be out of work again. Um, so nothing was consistent on his part um, as far as, you know, giving, you know, taking me out, going on dates, you know, buying me things. And those things didn't occur, you know, in my marriage. My marriage was like a struggle, a financial struggle. So in, in, a, in a strange way, uh, you're able to breathe possibly for the first time in your mind around uh, with him. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. It was a great, it, it, it felt great. To me, it just, I looked at him as, a man that had it together, a man that knew what he wanted and would go after life to get what he wanted. He had drive. He had motivation. He had his own business. Um, it seems like he was, you know, financially stable. He owned his house. He talked about how he bought his first house when he was 21 years old. Um, he talked a lot about the things that he did in his business and, you know, how he made his money. So what made me impressed about him is, his motivation, his drive, him being the age that he was and having his own business and um, just being able to hold it down, you know, as a black man. So this was impressive to, you know, impressive for me and how he treated me um, was, was also different than the way I was treated in my own marriage. So I was impressed all the way around. Um, I didn't see it coming, but, um, well, you're going from one end of the spectrum uh, on one end, and then you're going to the opposite end on the other, or you're perceived what you're what you're being shown the opposite end on the other spectrum. And at that point, I assume that you you're you're kind of fully bought in with um, what Mark is selling in in this relationship, and how you're feeling, and, and how you're trusting him. Right, absolutely. There was 100 percent trust, which I never felt. Um, in my marriage, 100% relaxation, 100% peace. Everything just felt good at this point. Um, dating him in the very beginning was great. It was like you go out, go out to dinner, didn't have to worry about me paying for everything. It was, it was just the way I felt a relationship should be. Um, and we, I think my birthday was coming up, um, around, we started dating in, um, I'd say around July of 2016, my birthday came up September and um, we started talking about plans for my birthday and what we were going to do. 
Um, and of course, because I always spent time with my kids, you know, anytime there was a birthday, we always celebrated it together. So, you know, I explained to him that, you know, I was going to spend the day with my daughter, have breakfast, and then I was going to go, you know, spend the day with my son. But now my son is in college. He's living on campus, which I didn't get. A, you know, I got a very hard state start, so I wind up not getting back to Baltimore till like about 8 o'clock, which he was kind of upset about. Um, but no big deal. You know, I didn't see any problem. He was a little upset. I understood because I you know, told him I would be back in Baltimore about three. I didn't get back until 8 o'clock. So we did go out to dinner. That was the only thing we did. Very nice restaurant. Um, um, we go back to his house, and, you know, I fall asleep, but I'm kind of very uncomfortable because I'm sleeping in his bed, and I'm used to sleeping in my bed. So I'm tossing, turning, and tossing, and turning. And he, you know, wakes up and said, what's wrong? And I'm like, nothing, I just can't get comfortable. So then he says, well, I know what it is. You didn't enjoy your birthday. So I'm like, no, that's not true. Um, I had a very good day. And he was like, no, you didn't. Um, it's your fault because um, I had a whole day planned and you were supposed to come back by 3 o'clock but you didn't get back here until 8, and then we didn't get out of the house until 9 o'clock. So there was nothing left to do. It's your fault. You should have came back. But I, I do have to say that the whole time I was driving back from Bowie to Baltimore, he was calling me, and he was asking me where I was and was I with another guy, which I didn't, you know, at that time I was just saying no. You know, I was with my son the whole time. I didn't. That got a late start. Um but that night, you know, turned out to be not a good night because he just kept saying, I know something wrong. You didn't have a good birthday. You didn't like what I did for you. And I was just trying to convince him that the birthday was good. I had a good time. Um, there was nothing wrong with us just going to dinner. But he wouldn't let off on it. He kept saying, it's your fault. And then eventually he got upset and took his phone and threw his phone across the room. Um, and I'm sitting there like, oh, my God. It's like, why would you throw your phone across the room? Like, your screen is going to be cracked. So I jump up off the bed. I run to go get his phone from the other side of the room and pick it up, and the screen is just, you can just see it cracked. The whole screen is just cracked. And I'm like, you broke your phone. Why would you throw your phone across the room? You know, so I'm feeling bad. I'm upset because I got him upset, and he's mad because he thinks that I didn't have a good birthday, and he just, and he wanted to make my birthday special. But I never saw <laughs> that that was a problem. And when I, you know, told my girlfriend what happened, she was like, oh, my God. She was like, why would he throw his phone across the room? She was just like, you know that doesn't sound right. That's not normal. So I'm sitting there trying to convince her. No, he was just upset because he wanted my birthday, you know, to be special. He wanted to do other things that day. So he was just upset. So I'm trying to convince her, you know, nothing's wrong. He was just upset. He just wanted to make me happy. And she's just like, no, that is not normal for a grown man to just throw his phone across the room and knowing that the phone is going to break. So, that was um, kind of weird for me um, to see that, but the whole time I'm just thinking, wow, you know, he really, you know, really, really cares about me. He really likes me. He really wants, he really wanted to make my birthday special. But so, you know, we put that behind us and, <clears throat> you know, we went on, we continued, you know, to date. And I would say, um, I eventually got to meet, he had this BFF, which was not a, um, which is a female, which I eventually got to meet his um, BFF, supposedly, which I'm thinking at this age, we don't have BFFs. Um, and, and for everyone out there to... who doesn't know that term, that is a best friend forever, correct? <laughs> correct. Yes. That is what a BFF is. And it's a female. So here it, we are. It's a female, correct? <laughs> It is a female. Yeah. So when, you know, he first told me about his best friend forever, I didn't really think much of it. Um, 
But he, his whole thing was about meeting her. So eventually I did meet her. But when I met her, I didn't get a good vibe. The vibe that I got was there was something more to to her than just the best friend based on her her actions and how she acted around me. And I kind of caught, when I was looking down at my shoe, I kind of caught looking, uh, when I looked up, I kind of caught her looking at me, giving me this mean, mean eye. But I got this vibe, and it wasn't a good vibe. And the vibe that I got that, there was something else going on between them. That's just the vibe that I got. You always make me feel like um, I was being crazy for even thinking something like that. You were being insecure. Um, and your insecurities is coming from your past relationships. You're creating things that don't exist. Just constantly, always, whenever we would get into an argument about it, he always tried to, like, make it seem like I was making a, a mountain out of a mole. It wasn't that. They were just friends. So um, at this point, are you believing what he's saying about you? I am. Like you, you 100%, you know, you start believing that you are insecure, that you are, that you might be creating things that, that, that don't exist and everything that he's telling you. Um, at, this, at this point, I started questioning myself, mm-hmm. questioning my behavior, questioning, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's right. Maybe I am secure. Maybe I do, you know, because he would always say you're bringing bag- baggage into this relationship from your previous relationship. It has nothing to do with me. It has something to do with it. Everything that you're feeling has to do with your relationship with your husband, not me. So I started questioning my own self. I started questioning my own behavior. I started and I, I assume a big I assume a big part of that is because no one else you know that knows him uh, has uh, ever voiced to you that uh, he is this way, and you've only seen him in this good light at how other people see him. So I'm is a, is part of your feeling that I must be the one that's wrong because this everyone sees him in this light. Everyone loved him. Yeah, because everyone loved and- him. Anytime I did a show and I had a male guest, he would get upset. He started accusing me of cheating. And if I didn't introduce him or make it known to my guest that he was the owner of the studio and we were dating, he would get upset. And then he would accuse me of having sex with them because I didn't um, introduce him. And my thing for him was, I want people to take me serious. Um, I don't want them to know that, you know, my personal life, they don't have to know who I'm dating, and they definitely don't have to know that I'm dating you. I need for people to take me serious as a radio show host. Um, But there were women that would come in and out of the, you know, coming in all the time at the studio. If I was to show up, there would be women sitting there and, or if I would come to the studio late at night after, you know, to meet him because we were going out and it was late, it would be like sometimes 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock in the morning, the bell would ring and there would be a woman and I'm sitting there like, you know, why are these women stopping by the studio this time of night? Um, but he always had an excuse. Um, and if I question him about anything, in the very beginning when we first started dating, if I asked him a question, it was anything, whatever you want to know, babe, anything you want to know, sure, babe. It went from that to now, why are you questioning me? Don't question me about anything. So now, whereas I'm this woman who's a radio show host, um, who had a voice, and didn't have a problem with, you know, voicing anything. Just started feeling like um, I couldn't express myself anymore, express myself especially um, with him. Um, I started, we started spending a lot more time together. I found myself um, always with him, always at his house, staying at his house. Because now my son, you know, he's in college. He's staying on campus. My daughter has her own apartment. So it was just me in the home by myself. So I'm always at his house now. So now I'm starting to see a lot more of his behaviors and his habits now. 
So, you know, he also had a nighttime job where he worked at night and he would come in about seven in the morning and his phone would ring the same time every day. And then I started paying attention to that. I don't know. One day I just realized, you know what? I said to him, your phone rings the same time every day. As soon as you come in the house about 7.10, about 7.20, your phone is ringing. Like the same time every day. And I noticed that and I asked him about that. And it's, oh, don't question me about my phone anymore. Like his whole personality has changed now. It went from this nice, loving, gentle, caring, attentive person to this person who just felt like I was someone who, who he made it seem like I came into his life. And I fought at him. Like, I pretend I was something that I, that I truly, really wasn't. Um, I was this insecure person. I was this crazy person. Um, he made me feel like I was something that I wasn't. Um, so I'm at the house all the time. And, 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 like, he made it so, in his, in his mind... You're the one that chased him, and uh, he had a great life before, and now you're the one disrupting his right. life. Yes, right. But he's the one who sought me out. Mm-hmm. I didn't. It wasn't me that sought him out. I wasn't even thinking of a relationship when I started doing the radio show. Radio show. My whole thing was trying to do something positive for you know a group of women, and if I can just get a platform to do that then I was motivated and driven to doing that. Um, so it was he sought me out. But now that I'm at his house more, because that's where, you know, he wants me to be, you know, always with him, always at his house. Um, I'm spending the night over there more. So, you know. Um, so at this point, you're being controlled pretty heavily in the sense of, you, you feel that you can't c- express yourself because you know if you do, it will be frowned upon. Um, right. You, you know, you're over it. You're over at his home a lot, and now when you're over uh, at his home, uh, you, you know you're probably doing everything for him, um, and you're being blamed for a lot of things. And nothing you do is. Is, it seems to be like right. You, you can't do anything. Um, so you're walking probably on eggshells all the time, uh, I assume. Absolutely right. I um, So I was constantly staying at his house every single night. Um, so I'm there at his house. I'm, I'm, taking, I'm cleaning, washing his clothes, ironing his clothes cooking his breakfast, cooking his lunch, making his dinner, buying groceries in his house. I'm doing all of this, like, basically feeling like I'm in another marriage, like, basically taking care of him, basically servicing him and really not being fulfilled in any of my needs um, because I just I didn't feel like um, at this point that I was getting anything out of the relationship like I was in the beginning, um, in the beginning where, you know, he, he was taking me out. Um, he was more attentive, um, nicer, you know, buying me flowers, just little things that he was not doing anymore. I was doing everything for him, um, basically servicing him. That's what I felt like I was doing pretty much. And sometimes he would come in and say, shouldn't you be in the kitchen? And I'd be like, in the kitchen, yeah, shouldn't you be in the kitchen cooking, doing what women are supposed to do? Um, And then he would laugh. So, you know, I would laugh thinking it's a joke. (laughs) But really, that is how he felt. Um, I kind of felt like, you know, do this whole thing with him and him gaslighting me. I kind of felt like... A lot of confusion in my mind, just feeling like I'm going crazy. Um, Because we would argue all the time, like, with just simple things, not always just about the females, but it'd just be, like, any little thing just wasn't good enough. We would argue about it. Um, In this particular one time, you know, we started really arguing a lot, 
and um, his friend came and got him and took him out. And then when he came back, he was like, I brought you, you know, a crab cake dinner to eat, but I had already cooked something to eat. And I told him I'm full and I want to put it in the refrigerator. And he got upset about that. And he was like, you're selfish. I brought you something back to eat and you won't even eat it. And I said to him, I'm full, so I'm not going to eat. I just ate. I just had steak, broccoli, and potatoes, so I'm full, but I will eat it tomorrow. And he started calling me names, and the next thing you know, he's throwing crab cake at me. Crab cake went everywhere. It just, it, it, he... <laughs> It was all on the refrigerator. It was all on the rug. It was just food was everywhere. And he began to grab me, and I began to, you know, try to get him off of me. And the next thing I know, he balls up his fist, and he starts beating me in the head with his fist. And it shocked me, and it surprised me, and I couldn't understand why he was doing this. He was calling me. He was just been ridiculous and then he stopped and told me I'm leaving and when I come back all this stuff better be cleaned up and I was like no I'm not cleaning anything up but when he left I cried and I couldn't understand what was going on and I could have left and I don't know why I didn't leave but I could have actually got my things and left but instead I stayed I cleaned up all the crab cake off the floor. I back on the floor. I wiped down the refrigerator, and then I went upstairs. And he came back, and, you know, I pretend I was asleep when he came back the next morning. I questioned him about what happened, about him putting his hands on me and hitting me in the head and how my head was hurting, and he denied the whole thing and said, you're making it up. I didn't touch you. I didn't hit you. And I'm sitting there like, I know what happened. Like, he literally was convincing me that none of this happened and that it was all my fault and everything is all my fault. Like, that whole situation was my fault. And every time we argue, it's your fault. Um, And then, you know, he starts the, the, the name calling and the game blaming again. So... I don't know if he literally convinced me that it didn't happen. I just put it to the back of my mind and never brought it up again and never mentioned it again to anybody else. Were you, I, were you feeling um, ashamed uh, about what just like what happened there or, or, or embarrassment uh, uh, that you um, went through it and, um, I guess let it and let it slide. I kind of felt sorry for myself, and I felt ashamed and absolutely embarrassed to tell anybody. Um, my children didn't know what I was going through. My parents didn't know what I was going through at this particular time. I wasn't spending as much time with my kids anymore. Um, I wasn't calling and talking to my mom and dad. It had been months, whereas I talked to my parents um, every day. My dad, maybe two or three times a day. So you're, you've, now, been, you've, you've kind of self-isolated yourself here uh, in the sense of maybe he is or isn't being part of telling you not to be around them, but you're, I guess the shame and the guilt that what you're with, what you're going through and the behavior that you've been exposed to that you are kind of slowly taking yourself out of communication, uh, consciously or unconsciously. I think with what I was going through, because my mind was constantly rolling with what I was going through and questioning myself, like questioning who I am and questioning what I'm going through and questioning who he is and questioning how did I get in this situation to the point where not just, you know, that I just wasn't picking up the phone. I wasn't, you know, calling people as much as I just wasn't being myself anymore. Are you still recording your program at this point, your radio program? 
No, I'm not. My radio program ended because of the things, how the things ended. So, um, so essentially, really, right at this point, uh, I don't know how far we are into your relationship here, but I guess at this point, you don't, you aren't, you are not the same person you are when you began this relationship at all. Like you have changed, and absolutely. So do you? Uh, do you, you Do you know who you are anymore? Are you? So you're questioning that stuff most likely. You asking me today? Do I know who I am? Oh no, I, I'm asking you oh. at, at the time, like when it was going on. Were you like, "Who am I anymore?" Or like, you not even recognize yourself, and you struggle with that at that time? No, I didn't because I wasn't who I was. He he would say things and do things to me, like he would put me down. He would call me ugly. He would call me stupid. He would tell me I was weak. He would tell me my kids didn't love me. He would tell me my kids are disrespectful to you. Your friends don't care about you. Your friends are laughing at you. Your radio show is stupid. Your radio show is dumb. Nobody listens to your radio show. It's stupid. And all the time while he's saying this, he's laughing and he's giggling. And I'm crying. And I'm like, why are you saying these things? Like, um, I literally believed them. And I question myself. I question my sanity. I question my truth. And everything that he was saying to me about me and about people around me in my life, I believed him. Um, so outside of your family and how you were relating to them, does this start affecting other parts of your life? Like uh, what's going on at work and things like that? It affected my health, um, my blood pressure was uncontrollable. I wasn't sleeping anymore. I wasn't eating. I began to lose weight, um, loss of appetite, loss of motivation, loss of drive. I didn't have a direction, whereas I look forward to doing my shows on Sunday. I always had great ideas, and my co-host was like, you know, they just, they loved me. They loved my ideas. They loved my creativity. I couldn't think anymore. I had no thoughts. My creativity was gone to the point where I went on haters with my radio show because I just couldn't think. I couldn't focus. I didn't have the thoughts. I didn't have the focus anymore. Um, so I stopped doing, you know, temporarily I stopped doing the radio show. Um, and, this was a time where the New Year's came up, and we, um, we went with two of his friends, which was one of his best friends of 30 years, and his girlfriend. Um, we celebrated New Year's Eve together, and we got a hotel room. You know, we, we both bought food, and um, we celebrated at the Marriott. And when everybody else was asleep, I was awake. And his watch kept beeping, like going off because his watch was connected to his phone, and it kept beeping. And at first, you know, because normally I never really touched his phone before or anything, um, I just figured, well, maybe it could be his friends in the other room trying to reach him. So I picked it up, the watch, and that's when I saw the text come through saying, no 12 a.m. kids. So I'm reading it, but I'm saying to myself, what is this? Like, in the, you know, girl name was Ginger. Never forget that name. <laughs> um, and I'm saying to myself, I knew what it was. I read it. I knew exactly what it was, but I'm trying to convince myself it's something completely different. Um, that bothered me because now I'm saying to myself, all this time I thought this man was loyal Faithful, trustworthy, kind, loving, and gentle is not the man that I first met. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here questioning myself, knowing what I'm reading. No 12 a.m. quiz. I know exactly what it is, but I'm going over in my head what else it can possibly be. Maybe she's talking about a particular radio set. You know, because he did have, you know, the radio on. It would just be on where it would be recorded music. So I'm like, well, maybe she's talking about a particular radio set. But I knew exactly what it was, but I didn't want to believe it. So 
I started convincing myself something different. In a way, you're trying to make excuses for what you're seeing. Right. Yeah. So I never mentioned that. I never mentioned that text I saw because I wanted, I didn't want to even confront him about it because I didn't want it to be an argument and I didn't want to go through what I had, you know, the argument and stuff. So I never even mentioned it. But I did tell my girlfriend about it and she recommended not the same thing because then he's going to accuse you and tell you you're wrong because you went through his it's watch. Fun. Oh, right. yes. Right. So yeah. she said not to do it. Keep it to yourself for now. And I did. I didn't mention it. But what I did start doing was going through his phone. Um, he had that phone locked up and locked down. He had two phones. And I started being, you know, paying attention a lot more and not letting things fly anymore. Um, I would just do the stupidest things. Um, I would wait till he would be asleep. I would crawl out the bed so he would notice that um, I was moving. So I would slowly move and slitter my way out of the bed like I was a snake or something. And I would just get on the floor on my knees and, like, laying and just kind of, like, slowly move around to the side of the bed to get his phone and try to figure out what the code was to get in his phone. But I could never figure it out. Um, and then he took the, you know, he kind of would always wear his watch. But one day he left the watch home. And I got into the watch, so his watch was connected. You know how you can connect your watch to your phone? Mm -hmm. And it was connected to the phone so I could see all the texts. And I could see texts from the so-called BFS, the best friend forever, asking him, nowhere am I in this text about going to Puerto Rico for five days. And nowhere does she say, are you and your girlfriend or are you and your husband? It was her and him going to Puerto Rico together. I saw a text where they were setting up going on a date to a wine festival. I mean, and, and I'm saying to myself, all along I knew it because I found Mel in his home under his bed with her name and her address. So she had been living there. But he made it seem like, oh, she was living in the basement. So, I mean, I overlooked a lot of things. And so so, so everything you're finding here, you let slide. Say that again. Uh, everything that you were finding uh, in these moments, in all of these texts, yeah, uh, you you let slide completely. You didn't bring them up because you didn't want to go. I didn't to, bring them up. Yeah, because you nope. would be uh, okay. Um, no, I didn't bring them up to him. I was upset. I was hurt. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sleep at night. He would go to work at night. He would, you know, he would go to work at night. He would leave about 9.30, and he would get home about 7 in the morning. He would sleep a few hours, and then he would get up and do his studio sessions. I worked during the day from 11.30 to um, 8 o'clock at that point. Um, I'm not sleeping anymore. I was mentally sick, just sick, just hurt, just depressed. And looking back now, I, I can see how very depressed I was. I couldn't get up. I couldn't go to work. I couldn't sleep. I was staying up to like 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, just with this on my mind, everything I was finding, the text I was finding. Um, it just got out of hand. Um, it was getting out of hand. I didn't know what to do to make things right again, to make things normal again. Um at that time, I probably could have just left and walked away, but I don't even think that was an option for me at the time. It was like it was an addiction. It was like I had to be there. It was like I don't know. I just couldn't explain the feeling. I mean, other than the fact that I just had to prove myself to him that I am worthy. Um, I am a good person. I'm not crazy. I'm not creating situations that don't exist. I do love you. You know, I, I just spent most of my days trying to convince him of that rather than just walking away and leaving and saying, you're no good for me. Um, it got to the point where I continue every day. I was consuming it every day. Um, 
just consuming the fact, you know, while I'm washing and cleaning and keeping his house clean and cooking for him and packing his lunches and making his breakfast. And and I found that the, the girl that texted him on New Year's um, Eve, or should I say New Year's morning, New Year's Day, 12 a.m., he had been talking to her every day, three, four times a day while he was at work, while he was literally sitting next to me, while he was literally laying in the bed with me. He was texting her, sexting her, exchanging new photos with her. Like, I was so hurt, very hurt, um, very confused. And at that point, I felt stupid. I felt dumb. I felt like I allowed this person to just use me um, and just do what he ever wanted to do. But I couldn't leave. I wanted to leave. I wanted to say, F you, and walk out of the door. But I wasn't strong enough, and I could never understand why. I couldn't leave. I stayed. And I still didn't say or mention to him what I found. I was too afraid. I was too afraid to say anything. I was too afraid to question him, too afraid to challenge him, too afraid to confront him, too afraid. I couldn't even open my mouth. There were days he would come in from work and I would play it all out right before he'd get there, what I would say. And then he would get there and I couldn't do it. And... He literally broke me down into tiny pieces. Broke me down. Because I was no longer the person I was before I met him. He made me question myself. He made me question good in myself. He made me question my own sanity to the point where... I literally called my EAP at work and set up a therapy session. Um, I, I literally, in his life, in the beginning, he always said to me in the very beginning how beautiful I was and how I was the best thing he ever had and he's glad that God brought me into his life. I went from that to a devil, a demon, the worst thing in his life, just because I was questioning him about the wrong he was doing. I never did anything wrong to him other than love him, other than take care of him, other than nurture him, other than want the best in him and support him. And I can never understand how a person could be so mean to someone who has their back, who stands tall for them, who takes care of them. I just, it was so much confusion, so much fog, so much, like, just not understanding, like, and maybe that's what kept me there even longer because there was a need to understand. There was, I mean, uh, there was just so much, like, Lots of times he would say, if I did threaten to say I was going to leave or break up, he, he would, like, threaten me. He would convince me, literally, that nobody's going to want you. Nobody's going to love you like me. Nobody's going to take care of you like me. Like, he would literally say things like that. Um, you know, and eventually, I, uh, around this time, now I'm moving in with him. I live with him now. Um thinking things would get better and things only got worse. They didn't get better. They got worse. I was drained, mentally drained, emotionally zapped out, spiritually down. <laughs> like this was supposed to be the best times of my life, the best relationship. Um, it definitely wasn't supposed to be a great relationship worse than the one I came out of. But it was. Uh, 
I found uh, some really nasty pictures on his. I found some really nasty pictures sent by the girl Ginger on his um, pet, the tablet, and. The whole time we were going together in a relationship, she was sending these pictures because they had dates on them. I got into his email and found emails that were exchanged between them two, which they had a previously intimate relationship they were in years ago. So at this point, you know, I'm finding myself in the basement, literally shaking and crying, like asking myself, what am I going to do? I have to get out of this. I have to. And I questioned him about it. And I told him, don't lie, because I saw the pictures. I saw all of the texts. I called the girl myself. I spoke with the girl, the woman, should I say. I had a very lengthy conversation with her. So everything was confirmed. Um, and this was the weekend before the 4th of July. And it turned out to be a very physical um, argument. You know, I pressed charges on him, of course. And he went to jail. He was in jail for two days. And when he got out, he pressed charges on me. Um, so we had a whole court issue that went down in the summer of 2017. I lost my car because my engine ceased. I don't have an apartment anymore, a place to stay. I'm living with my 26-year-old daughter, with my son, with my 17-year-old son, about to be 18. And um, So your life has now, at this point, has completely crumbled. I mean, from the beginning of the story... Uh, you know, you, yeah, you, you went from, you know, a, a, a life, uh, solid work, um, independent woman to now living with your daughter in a one bedroom apartment. Are you still working at this point? Um, I was still working after we broke up, but I, I got laid off. I'm not working there anymore. I got I got laid off just just recently. I got laid off from a job like in June of this year. But no, I was still working. Okay, there. so you're still working, but you you have a lot of financial problems. Uh, you're with your your daughter now. At what point? Um, well, at, at at this at this point now, going through the court situation, I had to take off work. I had to take time off from work. My boss. I had to go to, first it was embarrassing because I had to go to my boss. I had to tell him everything that happened. That was embarrassing to me. I had to reveal what I had been through um, just to keep from losing my job. Um, But at this point, at this point, do you understand in a way what's happened? Have you started to go to therapy of any sort? And, you know, did you try to, to figure that kind of stuff out? I did after, you know, the court situation, I was told by court situation that I needed to go to therapy because of what I've been through. And had I not gone to therapy, that I was going to wind up back with him and that I needed to um, reprogram my mind from where, from everything that he done. So one one second, you said something there. um, You said that. Did the court told you that you would probably go back to him, or did like a dom- or did a domestic violence agency uh, say that it was most likely you would go back to him? Well, I was in the courthouse at that time okay. when I was talking. Right, I was in the courthouse, and they recommend me to go to. I can't remember what um, what agency it was, but they were inside the courthouse, and um, they were helping me get my my all of my belongings out of his house um, because he refused to give them back to me. So the state attorney's office recommended me to work with those ladies. They work with women who have come out of abused relationships. 
You know, so I had to tell them everything that I've been through, and they told me that I've been through. They told me that I was dealing with a narcissist, and I was gaslighted, and I needed to go to therapy. And if I didn't go to therapy to, um, you know, heal through this um, and reprogram my mind, that eventually I probably will wind back in a relationship with him. Or moving forward, I wouldn't be able to move forward in a healthy manner in another relationship. So I did go, you know, I picked up, I did go and um, seek out a therapist through my EAP, through my work. And I went, I think maybe like three sessions, but I don't, I wasn't ready, I guess, at that time to go because I stopped after the third session. I felt like. Yeah, I was going to ask you. It's one thing to be told that and to go, but it's another thing to actually feel and understand what they're talking about. So you weren't ready for that, most likely yet. No. Yeah. No, I did. I, I went third session. I stopped. I felt like this is something I needed. I can do on my own. I'm strong enough. Because going to a therapist made me feel like there's always a stigma there, and I felt like I'm not crazy. I felt like I was living out everything that he said I was. And to me, going to a therapist was admitting that I was exactly what he said I was and needed to do. So that was one another reason why I didn't want to go. I felt like I can do this on my own, even though I was in a deep, dark, black hole. I was out of, I, my job gave me two months off. So I was out of work from July to the middle of September um, with pay. And for the most part of it, I couldn't get up every day. And my kids watched that. They watched me wither away. I lost 25 more pounds. Um, I was then fragile. Um, I was in a deep, dark hole. I could not get up. I wasn't eating. You know, maybe I would sip on some water. In the middle of the night, I would get up and roll up some cheese with a piece of lunch meat. But as far as sitting down and having a full breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I didn't do. I couldn't do it. I just was, I was in a deep hole at that point. And what kind of pulled me out of that hole was reconnecting with a friend of mine from um, one of my old jobs I had. And she would come by and get me out of the house. And, you know, we go hang out at happy hour. So now I'm drinking every day and I'm, I'm out of the house. You know, once I started back work, you know, I would go to happy hour. But I just couldn't move forward, you know, without something to help. So it was soothing just having, you know, wine, you know, a glass of wine or two or three led to maybe four or five or six now. Um, And, you know, just not being productive at work, not meeting my goals at work, getting written up at work. Um, almost losing my job again once I came back off a sabbatical at work. Um, just having breakdowns at work, just not being able to get the things out of my mind that he convinced me of. All of the, the mental abuse, the, the, the verbal abuse just keeps coming back and can't get it out of my mind. Um, and then, you know, I started again, like I said, drinking a lot and then using, you know, sex as a band-aid. And I winded up back, going back to him in the beginning of the year of 2018. And things seemed to be a little okay, but nothing really changed, you know, with the... The, the demeaning and the name calling and the uh, abuse. Um, I do remember this one instant when uh, we first got back together and he told me to come to his house and I went to his house and we were talking. There was a lot of yelling and screaming because he was upset at me for him going to jail. And again, you know, instead of just taking the responsibility and accountability for what he did by putting his hands on me and leaving bruises on me, he blames me for that. And 
the whole thing of me going back and meeting with him that day at his house was so that I can speak my truth. So I can tell him, this is what you did to me. This is what I went through. And while we were broken up, I couldn't even get that out because it was all about him. It was all about what I went through. It was all about me going to jail. It was all about you lied. It was all about nothing. He didn't even listen to a word I said. We wind up breaking up again, getting back together again, break up and getting back together again. So this last time that we got back together, the beginning of um, 2019, um, I convinced myself that I was stronger and that I was going to set boundaries. And I told him this. And we talked for days, you know, before we literally said we were going to get back together again. But he told me he changed, that he was not the same person, and that he was ready to grow and build with somebody. And I believed him. And, yeah, it was good for a while. It was great. We went on trips because now I got laid off from my job in June of 2019. I wasn't going to go back to work. I was going to use my severance and live out on it and take a break. We traveled. You know, we went to Puerto Rico. We went to Miami. We did short weekend trips to Virginia, um, a lot of trips to Virginia. Um, we did a lot of things. We spent every day together. <laughs> and I don't know why I was convinced that anything would be any different because they weren't. They were the same old thing with the women texting and the women calling. And but I don't know. For some reason, it's like he had a hold on me. Like he was still, like, had that strong, like, hold on me mentally, emotionally, and physically. Um, and then texting, you know, everyday texting, just all day constantly texting. And he's texting me and saying, you know, a lot of demeaning things and, you know, doing the laugh out loud and, you know, and I'm reading the text and I'm trying to explain myself to him. And I'm like, you know, not understanding, you know, why does things have to be like this? If you love someone, you don't treat someone like this. You're not harsh with someone. Um, It's like he wanted me to fall. It's like he didn't want me to be good. Um, it's almost like he was waiting for me to come back just to do this um, and just to get back at me. Um, and I wind up, you know, because he wouldn't, you know, he blocked me is what he did. Um, and I was trying to, I would, you know, call him to try to, you know, like prove myself and explain myself to him. And he would do that a lot. Like whenever he would get mad at me, he would block my calls. Um, and it hurt. Because I spent so much time with this person, so much put so much energy into this person, so much time in my heart and my love and my trust to get nothing back. And I don't really think he has ever had any intentions on giving anything back other than just receiving. And I started falling again, catching myself falling again in that deep dark hole. And, and because I didn't want to feel that pain that I was feeling at that moment and at that time, I just really wanted to go to sleep. I didn't want to kill myself, um, even though I knew that's what I was doing. I just didn't really want to feel the pain. I didn't want to have to go through it again. Um, so I took. Um, a bunch of medicine, painkillers that I had that was in under my sink that I had been taking for back pain. I took, I must have had um, 
about maybe 10 to 12 of them left in the bottle. I took those along with drinking a whole bottle of wine and I woke up to a bunch of police officers, a bunch of EMT workers, maintenance people, and my daughter um, trying to, you know, bring me bring me back. <laughs> and they wind up um, taking me to the hospital, and I was in the hospital from October 31st of this year until November the 7th. And they would not let me leave the hospital. They didn't think I was ready to leave. Um, I couldn't leave until I started taking medication, which I refused to take the medication they wanted to put me on. And um, so I decided to take it, and they released me. But while I was there, you know, I was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and... PSTD, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, I was told to seek therapy, which they did that before I left the hospital. So I already had um, a therapist to go to. And um, I began therapy. And that's what I'm doing now, the therapy, the journaling, and just trying to understand the abuse that I've been through, doing a lot of research on narcissistic abuse, doing a lot of research on the personal disorder, and I think just understanding what I've been through, the abuse that I've been through, and realizing the reality of it will help me, will be part of my healing, and that will help me not to reach back to something that was never good for me in the first place. So as far as stuff that you and your therapist are working on, is are you still dealing with um, rewiring the part of your brain that still believes what uh, he had to say about you? Or do you not believe those things anymore? I do not believe those things okay. anymore. It's a process for me, and I, 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 what I believe is he told me those things to belittle me, to make me feel that way as a way to control me. That's what I believe. So before we, sorry, so before we um, finish off the show, do you have any uh, last words? My last words? Or to listen to your intuition. Never second guess because your body knows. Um, when that inner voice tells you something is wrong, listen to it. I feel it's very important as women that we stay aligned um, with who we are. And always staying true to yourself. Never water yourself down for anybody else. The most important thing that you can do for yourself as a woman is to stay true to who you are. Um, that's important. And the only way to stay true to who you are is to love yourself first. If you don't love yourself, then that leaves room for situations and, and relationships like this to enter into your life. So it's, it's very important, self-care, self-love, self-reflection, and staying true to who you are. And when you do that, and I say never water yourself down. And I say that because we don't, and that's, that includes everyone. We water ourselves down a lot to make other people feel comfortable. And it's not our job to make other people feel comfortable. 
you have to be comfortable with, within yourself, within your own skin. So we do that a lot of times. And what we're doing is we're taking away from ourselves when we water ourselves down. Stay 100 always. That's very important. And that's because the, the truth is within yourself and it starts within yourself. And you stay aligned and centered within yourself when you have all those things. Well, thank you, Essence, for being on the show and sharing your story with me and everyone out there today. Um, you should be proud of yourself that you've made it out to the other side, that you're getting back to uh, where you need to be. And I just want really uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for taking part of the show. And hopefully uh, people out there are going to hear your story, resonate with it and uh, feel less alone. So thank you. Um, and for everyone else who is listening, thank you for listening and have a good night.